uh, webinar. Um, I will just start by um, uh, giving you a short introduction about uh, open air and uh, what we do. Um, sorry. Just trying to move to the next slide. Thing I have, I might have a bit of a problem. Yeah, let me know if you want me to share your slides, Marina. Um, maybe uh, should I stop sharing then? Because, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, open air for those who are not uh, very familiar with what open air is uh, and what we do um, has grown uh, over the years uh, through a series of uh, project phases uh, from uh, linking Europe's uh, repository infrastructure to its current phase that uh, extends and support the open air mission to implement uh, open science. Um, to enable this shift uh, towards uh, openness and transparency, we work on different uh, aspects and uh, also we work with a wide uh, range of uh, stakeholders. Um, if we could move on to the um, third slide, please. Um, so our work focuses uh, on, um, um, on aligning policies so as to support the um, coordinated transition to open science and we also help funders and uh, institutions uh, monitoring uh, their research uh, outcomes. Uh, we also build uh, common standards uh, to enable interoperability, discoverability, transparency and uh, um, enhance the reproducibility of um, uh, research. We also support uh, researchers, but also um, other stakeholders like uh, funders, um, uh, universities, uh, also um, um, all the administrative uh, staff and the people who are involved in project management um, through a number of uh, guides uh, and uh, FAQs that we have developed uh, over the years. Uh, but we, we also organize uh, webinars and, uh, um, and workshops. And uh, we also have um, um, a help desk uh, to which you can um, um, uh, you can contact uh, contact us um, directly. Uh, may I ask uh, Irina to move to slide number three, please? I think this should be number three. Oh. Do you um, want the next one? Uh, we cannot see. We're still seeing uh, slide number one. Yes, it's not moving. I think it needs to go in presentation mode. It is, yeah. Ah, there we go. Ah, okay. Thank you. And um, as I was uh, mentioning, um, um, uh, we have developed a number of support materials throughout the, um, the years that cover different aspects uh, of uh, open access and uh, um, open science, such as uh, um, dealing with issues such as uh, data management plans, uh, copyright and licensing uh, issues, uh, um, also dealing uh, with uh, compliance with the Horizon uh, mandate um, or uh, um, um, issues uh, around the, the management of um, uh, research data. Uh, we have also developed a number of services, uh, for example, Argus, which is an online tool for creating and publishing uh, DMTs. Um, the Amnesia, which is a, a data anonymization tool. And we also have the validator service um, that enables testing uh, your repository compatibility with the open air guidelines. And then you can uh, register your repository for aggregation and indexing in uh, um, open air. 
um, we encourage you to browse through our, our portal um, and, and where you can see all the, the services and the support materials that we have uh, developed um, um, over the years. Um, if we could move to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so a core element of the, um, of the open air is the uh, European network of uh, open access desks uh, known as uh, the NOADs. Um, this is a network that is composed of uh, open access and open science uh, experts that have um, a key role um, uh, at the national level in the um, transition to open science. Um, they work with uh, national stakeholders, uh, but they also help in voicing uh, their, their needs uh, uh, at the European uh, level. Um, again, we encourage you to, um, um, to visit the, the open air portal and uh, uh, see who the, the NOAD is in, in, in your country, and we encourage you to, to get in touch with them. Um, uh, NOADs are, uh, are very active. They, they, they organize uh, um, a number of, uh, um, of local uh, events of, uh, of different types. Uh, um, uh, so um, we encourage you to, to liaise um, uh, with them. And um, finally, a few words about the, um, um, the policy and, uh, and legal um, task force. Um, within Open Air Advance, we have set up uh, two um, task forces, one focusing on, on policy and uh, uh, legal issues and one focusing on, on RDM. Um, the aim of the, the task forces is to raise awareness and increase uh, competences on various aspects of uh, open science. And in the context of the, the policy and uh, legal task force, we have um, uh, developed among others uh, policy templates for uh, um, uh, funders and uh, um, research institutions to facilitate and support them, uh, all those uh, who wish to either develop or align their policies with the um, European framework. We have also developed um, a checklist and uh, we have organized a, a series of webinars uh, to exchange ideas and, and, and best uh, practices. And today's uh, webinar is actually uh, part of, the, of this uh, work and we will focus, as you know, more specifically on the developments um, around the uh, planet. Uh, so we are very happy um, to welcome our uh, two speakers. Um, uh, the first one is uh, uh, Johan Rurik, who is an open access champion for Coalition S. Uh, Johan is a professor of French uh, linguistics at Leiden University, and he has over 20 years of experience as an editor, uh, first as the executive editor of Lingua, and since uh, 2015 as the uh, co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Fair Open Access Journal uh, Glossa, um, that is a journal of general linguistics. And among other functions, uh, Johan is the president of the Fair Open Access Alliance and the member of the Academia Europea. Our second speaker is uh, Niamh uh, Brennan, um, who is the program manager of uh, research informatics in Trinity College Library Dublin, where she works on the development of uh, Trinity's uh, research support system and its uh, institutional repository uh, Tara. And Eva um, is also um, an open air uh, node for um, Ireland. Um, so, Johan, the, the floor is all uh, yours. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to try and share my screen and uh, do, do uh, yell if it doesn't work. Um. So, can you see? Yes. Yes. So you can see this. I'm just asking because I mean, that if for you it didn't work as well, uh, Marina. Yeah, no, it's, no. it's fine. We, we see it, thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so, so again, thank you for inviting me. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to speak about uh, planners. Um, and uh, somebody updates, uh, but I'll start from the start and I'll give you um, 
uh, f first a summary of what I'm going to talk about. My talk will take about 20 to 25 minutes. I will first talk about coalition S, so who we are, uh, why Plan S was devised, uh, what the strong principles are that Plan S is based on, uh, the implementation guidance that we have developed and the challenges for it, and how we work with key stakeholders. Um, uh, the other activities that we are devising, and other activities and policies, uh, and uh, the questions, then there will be time for questions and discussion. And uh, maybe Irina can moderate some of the, the, the discussions in the chat. I, I would appreciate that because it's a little bit hard to, to, to do everything at the same time, but we will see how it goes. So this is my summary. Um, Coalition S uh, is uh, currently con uh, consists of uh, 24 funders, 24 funders among uh, whom there are uh, a lot of uh, national European funders from Austria to the United Kingdom. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, the, the most important European funders in terms of the numbers of grants and, uh, and, and money involved are the European Commission and the European Research Co Council. But there is also a more international dimension to uh, Coalition S. We also have uh, charitable foundations on board, most importantly, the Wellcome Trust and the Berlin and the Gates Foundation have joined us, and also Aligning Science Across Parkinson's, which is Sergey Brins from uh, Google, Sergey Brins uh, Foundation to combat uh, Parkinson and do research into Parkinson. We also have a glo more global dimension. Our World Health Organization is a member of Coalition S, uh, Jordan, Zambia, South Africa, and the African American Academy of Sciences uh, are members. We uh, have also signed the Sao Paulo statement uh, with, uh, together with America Cielo African uh, Open Science Platform and OA 2020 to coordinate the transition uh, towards open access and to coordinate policies. There's also coordinated action with Open Access 2020, OA 2020. Uh, it's the German organization that is organizing worldwide uh, transformative agreements towards open access. And we have coordinated access with COAR, the organization for open access uh, repositories. So, so that's our scope uh, for now. We, of course, have a um, willing to uh, accept new members, new funders, not only funders, by the way. Um, I mean, we, there's often the conception that Coalition S is just about research funding organizations, but in fact, we also uh, accept uh, research uh, performing organizations and members, anyone who is willing to implement our three, 10 principles in the next few years is welcome to, to join uh, the effort. Um, why, uh, why was Plan S devised? Uh, now, the funders organization, the funding organizations in Coalition S want the following things. They want to accelerate science by making results immediately available to the largest possible audience worldwide. They also want to greater transparency in research communication. Uh, as we also see in the current COVID-19 situation, uh, Great transparency and immediacy of uh, sharing results results is imp ex ex extremely important in, in making progress and finding solutions. And of course, why would we limit this to, uh, to COVID-19, right? I mean, this should be extended. The same is true for other uh, important uh, illnesses like cancer. And it is also true for other challenges that, other challenges that await us like climate change. We need to have research immediately available to um, to face um, societal challenges uh, like, like these. And so there is no reason why any research should be exempted from, from open access. Um, what we also want is a, a cost-effective transition from the unsustainable subscription model to an open access model. And that is something that we are trying to, to effect by continuous uh, discussions with, with publisher and by publishers and by putting pressure on them, which is something that is uh, which is a part of our activity that is sometimes, I think, underestimated. Well, what funders want to do is simply use their funding to drive academic publishing towards uh, in full and immediate open access. Publishers, but also researchers, of course. Publi uh, uh, funders are in a unique position to use their cloud to tell uh, researchers where to publish. That's one thing. And they're also in a unique position and an independent position to, to, to tell publishers how they want uh, as clients of publishers, how they want uh, uh, the publications um, publishing to look like. Uh, uh, so that, that is something that we are trying to, to, to do. 
Um, now, why planners from the point of view of a researcher? I'm always put in a slide for, for that because many researchers still don't see uh, why open access is so important. This is a study that I love to cite by people like Freeman, or it may be familiar to most of you, but I'm doing it anyway. Uh, showing that in 2019, 31% of all journal articles are available in open access. Uh, but in fact, 52% of article views are to open access articles. Now, why is that? It's very easy to understand, of course, that an open access article is immediately available. You don't have to go uh, uh, behind a paywall. You don't have to pay up 30 euros or go through your library uh, in order to get it. You have immediate access. A few clicks on your phone or on your computer and there you go. You have, you have everything at your fingertips. So that means what people might also show is that in, in given existing trends that by 2025, 44% of all journal articles will be available as OA, but a full 70% of article views will be OA. So that means that if you're a young researcher and or even an older researcher, but if you're a re young researcher, 2025 is literally tomorrow. And if you're a young researcher, you want to publish in open access because that's how your articles will be viewed, right? I mean, nobody is going to look behind the paywall in order to have access to your great ideas. You have to make sure that they are out there for everybody to see. So that's my motivation for younger researchers. You, it is in your, this is in your own interest. Uh, even more so than publishing, I believe, in a prestigious journal, it is much more important to get that article out there in open access. Now, Plan S is built on strong principles. Uh, we believe uh, very strongly that research results are a public good, uh, public good like public transportation or electricity. That does not necessarily mean that it uh, can't cost anything or that we cannot involve uh, third party services, just like for public transportation and electricity. We can involve publishers uh, for the purpose of publishing articles, but we want uh, to have the results immediately available, just like public transportation is immediately available and electricity is. In, in this case, in our case, to accelerate science, we want those results to be available now. So that means that with respect to the current situation, there's a lot of no's that come up now in our principles. And the no's are no to paywall publications, no to embargoes, uh, no copyright transfer, publications should be in CC BY license and authors should retain copyright, that's in our principle one. Uh, no hybrid model of publication. No hybrid model of publication means that we don't want classical hybrid, so we want hybrid, pub, hybrid journals to transition fully towards open access. The current situation, as all of you know, is a situation where hybrid has stalled the transition to open access. Uh, there is a certain percentage of open access in these hybrid journals. There's still, which is a relatively low percentage. Uh, the, rest of these the rest of these journals is still behind the paywall. What we want to do is push the publishers to transition these journals fully to open access. And we want to provide a policy to uh, affect that. Um, of course, in our, uh, one of our principles is that pricing contracts and publication fees should be re transparent. Uh, this is a very important one and I'll come back to it later to show you what policies we are developing to that effect or what we have put out for that. Also, funders commit to support these publication fees, so individual researchers should not pay. Uh, um, that, is, that is a very important principle, just like the researcher does not uh, pay uh, uh, themselves for the blackboard in their office or their chair, they should not be paying for, uh, for funding, for, for publication fees. Publication fees should simply be a part of the grants or it should simply be a part of the, the uh, facilities that are put at the disposal of a researcher under, in our view. We have now multiple routes to open access compliance uh, under principle five, and I will talk about those in a minute. And very importantly, there is a full commitment on behalf of the funders to as assess research output, not on metrics and not on the journal value, not on the prestige of the journal, but on their intrinsic metrics uh, or merits. How do we do that? Most of the funders now have implemented DORA, 
uh, to this effect. So one of the ways this is done is by asking researchers to, uh, uh, to, to only provide a, a limited set of research results uh, between five and ten and to ask researchers why they think these are their best publications and that is what these researchers are evaluated on for grants. Also committees are explicitly instructed not to look at things like journal impact factor and other quantitative metrics. So this is a very important change in uh, research evaluation, research assessment and career advancement that we are trying to effect by subscribing to the DORA principles and to the Hong Kong principles. And of course we know that there are other, uh, other principles out there that, that, that are implemented so we are not wedded to DORA, but any research, any proposal that um, endorses these principles of not just evaluating researchers on quantitative metric is one that we will, that we uh, endorse and we would like to hear of. Okay, so these are our principles. Uh, uh, how is this being implemented? Now, the, as you know, the timeline this was already known last year, timeline has been extended by one year. This means that a number of our funders, not all of them, will ask, will apply Plan S uh, as of uh, for the calls starting in January 2021. So that means that for these funders, uh, most notably your UKRI, Welcome, and also, uh, also some others, the publications from calls must be in open access as of 1st of January 21. The other funders will follow in their own time. Uh, transformative arrangements will be supported towards to the end of 2024 uh, for now. I will talk about transformative arrangements in a minute. And there is now also greater clarity on compliance routes. What is important to know is that Coalition S supports a diversity of business models. What this basically means is that we support both commercial and non-commercial models of publication. Uh, the, in other words, we don't care about the color of your open access as long as it is open access. Any open access will do as long as it's CC by and copyright is retained. So, very important to note because this is a common misconception. Uh, Plan S is not just about gold open access. It, it is not about gold open access. I'm going to say it for a third time. It is not about gold open access. Immediate green is also fully compliant and I will show you how in a, in a minute. Uh, I, I should also say that by the end of June, we will come out with our green policy. I cannot give you any details yet because it, it is confidential. It's confidential for a uh, good reason because it is going to be very robust and vigorous and I think the uh, current audience will like it. Um, now the routes to compliance uh, in our under our um, arrangement are the following the gold there's the gold and the diamond route and that is of course an easy one uh, authors pub when pub authors publish in an open access journal coalition s funder will financially support publication fees for the author they are also willing to publish publication fees for diamond but of course it's a little bit more difficult because diamond does not work on the basis of fees per article and this is something also that we are trying to address i will come to, back to it later the second route very important route i cannot stress it enough is the green route the green route is the route that we use for subscription journals now um, contrary to popular opinion about coalition s uh, it is totally possible for an author to publish in a subscription journal it is possible on one big important condition that is the version of record and or the author accepted manuscript must be instantly made available in a repository now what we don't do in that case is to financially support publication fees in these hybrid subscription journals that we do not do and of course we ask the author to retain copyright to inform the publisher that they want to retain copyright and that they want cc by Right. But it is possible to publish in a subscription journal under, under planet. The third route that we accept is the, what we call the transformative route. And the transformative route is a route that is designed for hybrid and subscription journals. And this is when authors publish in a journal that is under a transformative agreement. I will talk about transformative agreements in a minute. So that means that uh, this the author is publishing in a journal that is on its way to towards open access in the sense that the revenue from subscription is uh, progressively being replaced by revenue from uh, publish and read deals. Uh, coalition of funders may choose to financially support open access 
under transformative uh, arrangements, or they may not to, because of course in many cases, especially the transformative agreement route, the payment will already have been made by the library consortium that the author uh, uh, belongs to, and of course we're not going to pay twice. Okay, so these are the three routes that we have for authors towards compliance. And of course, this can be a little bit confusing for authors. And for that reason, we are developing a journal checker tool. That is also something that I will address later in this talk. Uh, let me now talk a little bit about these transformative arrangements. I think most of you will be familiar with them, but since I cannot assume anything, I'm quickly going through these, these arrangements. Uh, we support three strategies, the first one of which is transformative agreements. Transformative agreements are contracts between library consortia that convert subscription costs to open access publishing costs, basically to publish and read. So it basically means that instead of paying just for reading, the, the library pays for reading and publishing of the researchers that are associated with that library or with that library consortium consortium. Open Access OA2020 is the most vigorous actor in that field, promoting transformative agreements to accelerate the transition to open access. Um, what we endorse that uh, strategy, uh, they aim for cost neutral TAs because of course publishers like to give, like to have an additional cost included in the, in the, in those uh, publish and read deals. Uh, we also uh, are in favor of cost neutral transformative agreements. In addition, we want these to adhere to planners principles and to ESAC guidelines, of course. Uh, so they should be temporary and transitional. We want to affect this transition in a defined time frame. This may be optimistic, but we have to try because I mean, we've been talking about open access for more than 20 years even, uh, and it really has to, get done, uh, uh, we believe. So we want to move uh, forward. Authors must retain copyright that is not negotiable for under planners and agreements uh, must be transparent. So th they must be transparent and deposited in the ESAC repository for, for contracts. Our experience also shows, our experience within planners shows that the most successful uh, transformative agreements are concluded when uh, you have a very large library consortium uh, most of the time these now are national, they're sometimes even regional, which is not a good thing. And also it is very good to associate national funders to these efforts because national funders can put extra pressure in these negotiations. So this is something that we recommend. The second transformative arrangement is uh, what we call the transformative model agreements. These are um, model, these are agreements between uh, smaller publishers, namely society publishers. Um, society publishers very often have only one journal or maybe five or six journals that they publish and it's very hard of course for them to negotiate with library consortia to get there, to, to get simple uh, transformative agreements. That, that is why we have developed this toolkit to develop model agreements between uh, society publishers uh, and, uh, uh, and libraries. And basically the idea is, is the same. Libraries continue to pay their old subscription in exchange for immediate open access of all journal content. Uh, content. No APCs change hands here. But again, the researchers who are associated with the library consortia uh, can uh, publish for free in, in this journal. There's actually a very nice pilot that is being conducted by the Microbiology Society. They are negotiating a transformative model agreement for their six journals, and a number of other societies have joined this. There's a couple, just, just yesterday I saw that a number of other societies have also adopted this model. You can find the, the example of the Microbiology Society in this link. I am sure my talk will be made available to you as a PDF after my presentation. So you should go have a look. It's really very, a very interesting model for these uh, societies uh, to, to move forward, I believe. All right, now the third uh, transformative arrangement, uh, maybe the most controversial, uh, that's the transformative journal route. This is basically our way of addressing hybrid, um, hybrid journals for the big publishers, namely this is a framework for journal transitions where we ask that the share of open access is steadily increased year on year, but with hard figures, 5% in absolute terms and 15% in relative terms. Also, the subscription costs have to decrease, of course, over that same period. We don't want to pay twice. And very importantly, the journal has to commit 
namely the publisher has to make a firm commitment in writing to transition the, uh, the journals in open access and to flip the journal to full open access when 75% of the research content is published open access. Um, this is a way of de-blocking hybrid. And as you may know, Springer Nature has, has announced uh, on 8 April that they would adopt uh, this, uh, this model uh, for their journals in uh, the next uh, few years. Uh, of course, the conditions are not yet uh, known. We will, uh, we will hear about that soon, uh, I believe. Um, about our implementation as well, I had said that we would make it easy for researchers. Uh, well, we are developing a journal checker tool uh, that will be available as of 1st January 2021 for the researchers that start to apply, have to apply Plan S. And this will allow, allow researchers to identify those journals that are compliant with Plan S. So basically, how does this work? It's, it's, this is a search tool where, as a researcher, you uh, put in your, uh, your, your employer or your funder, uh, you uh, type in the, the journal of your choice, and then a little window appears to say whether that journal is compliant with planners or not, or what you have to do as a researcher to, to be able to publish in that journal. So for instance, that little panel could say, look, uh, sorry, uh, this is a subscription journal, you will have to deposit your manuscript in, uh, in, in a repository, or uh, sorry, you're fine, this, uh, uh, you live in this country, uh, that, uh, that country or that cons your cons library consortium has a transformative agreement with this publisher, you are, f you are free to publish in this journal and uh, uh, the, the, the cost is taken care of. So that's what we want this journal checker tool to look like. Eventually, we have selected a supplier, the contract hasn't been signed yet, but work has already started and the initial focus will be uh, on identifying publishing venues that offer a route to compliance, that uh, offer CC BY, and that allow the author to retain copyright. Of course, later on in later iterations of this journal tool, next year, we will add some whistles and bells that make it, that make it even easier for researcher and get, that will allow for more information to be present in the journal checker tool for researchers, but also for libraries. Um, we work with key stakeholders, of course. We work with researchers groups to see how they react to planners, to see how we have to mitigate certain things, to, um, to adapt our plans and policies. And that's why we have established an ambassador network of various people who keep us uh, informed about what their, uh, um, what their uh, uh, constituencies and uh, researchers that they are in contact with are thinking about planners and how we should move things forward. Uh, in the same way, we are talking to early career researchers. Early career researchers are very often concerned that they will be disproportionately affected by uh, planners because they are very willing to publish in open access journals. They are also very willing to be evaluated with new research, with, with new evaluation methods. But they are very concerned that an older generation of researchers is not so inclined and will still be applying uh, old, uh, the, the, the old quantitative methods to evaluate them. So that's why we are trying to work with them to see how we can make things easier for them. Uh, they will also help us, for instance, in evaluating the journal checker tool. Uh, so we are in close contact with these uh, four uh, organizations, Global Young Academy, Young Academy Europe, Marie Curie Alumni Association and Eurodoc. In close collaboration with them, we move forward to measure the impact on, on young researchers and to put out, also to put out a survey to see how uh, people react uh, to, to, uh, to Plan S. Um, we are in active discussions with publishers as well. As I said, we, we, we did discuss a lot with Springer Nature about the transformative journal model. We also talked to the Society Publish Coalition. We talked to anyone who wants to accompany us in this transition to, to open access, uh, really. Um, we also, other journals and publishers support the green open access model. That is something that we are uh, willing to consider, certainly as an, at least as an interim model and possibly as more. Um, the Lancet Group had already announced they would allow their authors to um, publish, uh, to, to deposit a version of record in uh, full open access. But more importantly, a couple of publishers like Emerald and also Sage have decided that they would allow 
all the authors in their journals to deposit the version of record or the author accepted manuscript in a repository. And I have talked to these publishers and they, report, they do not report a significant drop in subs subscription revenue. So apparently the sky does not come down when, all, when publishers allow for green open access. Quite the contrary, business goes on as usual. Uh, so this is very important to note, uh, I believe. Um, we also, of course, work with uh, university associations. The European University Association and LERU have endorsed us. We are very willing to move forward with them. Of course, university associations are especially important in applying DORA because it's one thing to sign DORA. It's a very different thing to properly implement it. And that may be quite difficult at universities sometimes, but it has to be done. This is, this is where we are going. So we are in contact with uh, these key stakeholders to see how they can also uh, promote the transition to open access according to Plan S principles. Um, another important activity that we are undertaking is the transparent pricing. And as you know, we want to put pressure on the publishers to, to be more transparent about their pricing. Uh, the, the comparison I always use is uh, my local car, car mechanic. When I go to my local car mechanic to the garage to, for a tune-up of my car, uh, I do not expect my car mechanic to say, uh, Mr. Rorick, uh, the price is going, this is, it's going to be 2,000 euros, but I'm not going to tell you whether you get uh, an oil change, uh, whether your windshield wipers will be changed, whether your tires will be changed. It's just 2,000 euros, right? And your car will be fine. If I say that about a car mechanic, it sounds ludicrous. Uh, when you say that about an APC, it seems completely normal. So we, we should change that. And that's why I think it is important to get uh, more uh, transparent pricing. And um, that is also what, the, what we have now implemented. We want to make the nature and prices of open access publishing services more, more transparent to, build, uh, to rebuild confidence between the stakeholders and to show uh, to, to show that prices are fair and reasonable and to restart uh, some competition in, in that market, which is now, of course, sorely lacking. We have therefore recently announced our price transparency requirements. And from July 22 onwards, uh, only those publishers who offer price transparency uh, will be eligible to receive publication funds from coalition as members. So that's a strong statement. We require transparency, otherwise no pay. Um, the two approved price breakdown frameworks for this purpose are the following. There's one by the Fair Open Access Alliance, uh, of which I am the president, as you know. This is, has already been uh, implemented by uh, Frontiers, MIT Press, uh, Copernicus, and MBPI. And the second one is the Plan S price and transparency framework that was developed by Information Power. And this has been piloted, not implemented, but piloted by a number of publishers that you do see there from annual reviews all the way to Spring and Nature. Uh, what is the difference between these two breakdown uh, frameworks? The difference is the following. Uh, the plan is uh, the information power uh, breakdown is, an inf is, is very fine grain. It's on the journal level. So uh, we ask publishers there to provide information on the journal level in terms of prices for the services and also a number of other uh, information, the uh, uh, pieces of information. The breakdown of uh, public publication services from the Fair Open Access Alliance is a bit more coarse grained and it can be implemented at the publisher level. So a publisher, especially a small publisher, for instance, can easily say, look, we have this APC, let's say 1100, and that APC can be cut down in the following components. We do that because this, is, uh, uh, this makes it easier for certain publishers, especially small publishers, to make the effort. Because if you have uh, lots of journals that you have to do this for, of course, this requires considerable resource. Now, eventually, of course, we will want to have price transparency at the journal level, but we also want this to be a, a, publishers to be able to do this gradually. And that's why we have these two, uh, these two frameworks in, in uh, for price transparency. Um, so it's not one size fits all. That's a, also an important message we want to, to send with this transparent pricing. Um, an example of this transparent pricing is, for instance, the one by Fair Open Access Alliance. Uh, we have several service buckets that we want publish, uh, the publishers to price. 
Uh, one is journal operations, the second one is publication, fees to editors, you know, what, what are the expenses, uh, what is communication, what is, gen uh, what is more general uh, costs, what are discounts and waivers. So these are the kinds of things that we want transparency for. Uh, this is also then allows uh, researchers and libraries to compare across publishers eventually and to see where the best uh, price, uh, the best value for price lies. And we, will, we also hope that this will restart competition in this, this important uh, area. Um, another thing that we are looking at uh, is uh, how to support diamond publishing, non-APC funding models. Uh, we say in principle five that we support the diversity of business models, but of course a criticism that we have often heard is you are only looking at gold open access, you are only looking at legacy publishers. Now, the reason why we look at why we have looked in the past at uh, legacy publishers first is that we also want to take into account our researchers. Whether we like it or not, these legacy publishers are where our researchers want to publish. And of course, we can start from scratch and uh, build new journals and ask our researchers to, to publish there, but that is not going to win the race eventually. Eventually, we are going to have to also accommodate our researchers and put pressure on the legacy publishers to change the system towards a more fair system, a more transparent system, uh, and that is why we started there. Uh, and we cannot do everything at the same time. At the same time, we are very much aware that there are diamond models out there, that they that are very important in certain disciplines. Um, and one problem for the funders, and I'm saying this very honestly, uh, is simply that diamond initiatives really rely on per unit payments. And the per unit payment is, for, for funders at least, the most easy payment because it is volume, right? I mean, a, a, pub, a funder uh, gives out grants. Within those grants, there is an item for publication, for publication fees, and that's very easy to administer and to, 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 uh, to have an overview of. Uh, for funders to indiscriminately shower all diamond initiatives that exist in the world with uh, all the money that they would want is, is, is a lot more difficult. How do you do that? What are your criteria? So that is why we want, a ten, uh, one, why we want to launch a tender for study on diamond journals and platforms that asks the question how we can fund, how we can support diamond publishing. Um, uh, the, we want an analysis of the global landscape and the funding models, and we want to know how, how we can do this uh, globally. And what, what, is, what is really needed and how we can bring this, this forward. Now, the tender for this process uh, closed on uh, April 24, and we received 11 proposals uh, to do this. And uh, the outcome will be made uh, uh, made public uh, next week, uh, and uh, I, th I think you, you will like it um, because it, it, it involves a very large consortium of, of players that, uh, that, that are, have been very active in the past in this, in this arena. Um, but I can't tell you now, we will announce it next, uh, next week. So this is also part of our activities. Now, uh, as part of our other activities, there is, is, uh, is that we have now established an office at uh, ESF in Strasbourg. Uh, that office is uh, paid for with a grant of uh, two, two million, uh, contributed by a subset of Coalition S funders. I have to stress that being a member of Coalition S does not mean that you have to pay a membership fee. This membership fees are completely voluntary. But this was the case here. We have now have a program manager in place since February. 2020, that's Nora Pape Leroy. Um, there's Robert Kiley, who continues as the coordinator of Plan S uh, from the Wellcome Trust in London. And there is myself, who is talking to you from his home in Brussels. Uh, I'm the Open Access Champion, and I uh, am the, the person who tries to present uh, Plan S and uh, present it and represent the coalition uh, in uh, uh, events such as, such as these today. Um, now, to conclude, I would like to say that, of course, Plan S and, and uh, Open Access is part of a much, much wider uh, open science movement. Uh, open science is not just about articles. Articles are, in a sense, the gateway to uh, data, but it's also about, of course, open software, open metrics, open, uh, open peer review, and many more other things that we want to see made open. Uh, this has to be said. And, of course, uh, the last thing I would say is that 
The ambition is to make open access possible, but in order to do that, we need a global coalition, a coalition of all colors of open access and uh, of funders, of institutions, of researchers, and of publishers. And I would like to stop there and give the floor to, over to discussion, uh, if you would like. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thanks a lot, Johan. So we have over a dozen of questions, sir. Uh, and um, I don't know how we want to proceed to take them now or take them after Neve's talk. Because there are questions in the Q&A. Yes, and is there, is there some... anything that most pressing, Irina, that you would like me to, because I mean, I don't know how many of these there are. Uh, uh, there are a lot, there are at least uh, 16 questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, maybe I don't see them all. I see, let me see. Mm -hmm. uh, in the green round, do the authors need to retain copyright in order to comply with PLNS? Uh, yes, preferably. Now, of course, Rome isn't built in a day. I mean, it might be that this is not always easy to obtain. But yes, we would definitely like the authors to tell the publisher that they want to keep copyright. Yes. Um, one more. A question for Johan. Why is a journal checker being developed and there are already some available like Simago? Simago is not a journal checker tool. It, it will not allow you to see whether a journal is under a transformative agreement. It will not allow you to see whether a journal is, uh, is, uh, is uh, compliant with Plan S. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a journal finder tool, but it's not a journal checker tool. Um, how do you envisage that planners can make publishing much less costly? Yes, uh, I wish. Well, one, one of the things, one, uh, I, I do envisage, I do think that the fact that these prices will be more transparent will kickstart competition between publishers again. I mean, if the price differences are too great and they are not properly justified, there will be, there will be a move away from those, those publishers, right? Uh, if for the same price you have served better elsewhere, you will go elsewhere. Um, that is my uh, that is my answer here. And then, if you open Q and A, uh, I'll I'll read some of them to you. Q and so A. The, uh, yes, Q and A. It, it's it's uh, next ah, to yeah, participants. Yes. Okay, uh, let me see. Ah, uh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, is there somewhere a list of funders who will plan uh, implement planners from January first to June? Yes, you can you can see that on our website, I believe. Uh, I think the, there's three that are starting, UKRI, Welcome, and uh, uh, Research Ireland, Ireland uh, the, the Irish funder, SFI, I think, uh, that's joining us. And then the others will follow uh, very soon after that. Um, this is a very specific one, and we move the commitment to FLIP by December 2024. Well, yes, we removed the commitment to FLIP by December 24, um, because uh, it was very difficult, and this was not just one publisher, many, publisher, uh, many publishers said that it's very difficult for them to commit for all their journals to FLIP by, by 2024. Uh, so it was much easier to put in a percentage at which they have to FLIP because that, that gives them a bit of extra time beyond 2024. Um, this is, this is what, what, what we decided. Uh, a key actor in the process are librarians. They must understand that workflow, workflows change. I think this is not a question, but... Um, yeah, and, and then there is a question, um, journal check at all, how to provide data for local journals, maybe through the OIJ? Yes, the OIJ will definitely be, uh, be involved in the journal checker tool. And of course, you can also simply contact the, the supplier for the journal checker tool, which will be, uh, 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 whose name will be av made available next week. So by all means, contact them to say that you want to be considered in their tool. Um, then a question from Alexei Kowalewski. Correct me if I'm wrong, but only country can join this initiative to yeah. single institution. No, it's, it's, uh, well, single institution, well, in principle, we, uh, we, I mean, we started with research funding organizations, but it is also possible for research performing organizations to join if they commit to implementing the principles of Plan S. So it's not countries joining, indeed. Toma is right that it's not, uh, that it's not countries. Uh, by university, that is certainly something that is that, that, that we can consider. 
universities cannot be member Thomas's, but it's that it's it's not so clear. This is really something that we are willing to consider. Um, what do I see? Yeah, comment Are you from various coalition members discussing coordination of policy? Yes, every day actually. Um, we are the, the different funders of planets are, are moving at a similar pace, and we are coordinating these 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 efforts. That does not mean that all of the all of the policies will be identical, but they are moving in the same direction. Um, what is? I think Toma has already answered a lot of questions for me. That's great. Toma, by the way, is part of the, young, uh, the early career researchers that we are that we are talking with. So many thanks, Toma. A double question: Will the, with the updated by the time yes of course uh, there is there is a difference between uh, transformative agreements pablo and uh, the and uh, transformative journals uh, the transformative agreements are really meant uh, to to be at the library consortia level and the transformative journals are for those uh, for those journals who, who uh, who have more difficulty entering into a uh, transformative agreement. Uh, the, the, the reason that we have these different tools is, is, is quite simple. We do not want to give the publishers an excuse not to move forward. I hope that helps a little bit in answering your question. What else? Can the publishers be encouraged to share some kind of plan S compliant page or seal in journal page? It might be difficult to get the researchers to go to one journal check a database. Why, why would it be difficult? I'm not sure that I understand it. Where is this question? Um, uh, it's the first one uh, in open questions now ah, from so Mar Marco. Can publishers be share some kind of... Um, well, they could certainly be encouraged. The question is that we, we, we don't want to rely on the publishers. We want to make, make sure that we, are, that we are able to help our researchers as well. I mean, a, 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 a publisher is, is rarely going to say, oh, we are not plan as compliant, don't publish with us, right? I mean, that's, that's not likely. So that's why we have the journal checker tool that will give you a straight answer. Um, uh, do we have other? From Kunle, me, uh, what, yeah, what fr I, fr from Kunle, all uh, second one in open, um, I think the TMA no. One with library consortia is important. Are you aware of any libraries organizations that have adopted this model? Well, yes, I, uh, there, there are many actually. So, for, but but of course, it's on. Uh, it depends on every. So, for instance, the the microbiology society has uh, adopted TMAs. Uh, for instance, uh, with all the UK uh, libraries, they they have an agreement in place like this but also with many other countries uh, in Europe and also in the US, uh, U USA with a number of, uh, with a number of um, uh, libraries there. You should see on their website, I don't know by heart how many, can, but I know that they, are at least, they, they have at least agreements, the Microbiology Society now with seven or eight, or, or eight library consortia around the world. Of course, this is slow going in the beginning, but I think it will, it will pick up speed as, as, as this is shown to be successful. Is that a good answer? Um, then Ellie's question about Coalition S also strongly encourages that research data and other research outputs are made as open as possible and as close as necessary. Is there also a task force in the Coalition busy with this topic, research data management? Uh, no, we are not, we are not about data. Uh, we can't, we, we can't, like I said, we can't do everything. We are really focused on articles and open access articles. So we, are, we, do, we do not have a task force on, on, on open data. That is something that will also be taken over, I think, by EOSC and by the conditions that are attached to that. That will be determined. I um, yes, TAs are not supported after 2024. Does it simply mean that publishing under transformative is not compatible? No, it does not mean that, of course. I mean, we hope that there will be just, we, we just hope that there will be many transformative agreements in place after 2024 so that things are in open access. It's just that we have set ourselves a timeline for now of 2024. That is, that is all it means. Right? So by then we hope to have 
effected major change. Uh, although, of course, it is, more, uh, it is very likely the coalition as will subsist after that time, but our plans now are up until 31st December uh, 2024, and then we will regroup and uh, reorganize uh, for the next bit, I think. And a second question uh, from Thomas Lunden. Thanks for the presentation, Johan, about the journal Check It All. Will it give information on copyright retention and licenses also for green uh, AM versions of articles? Uh, I think, uh, well, in, in, a, in, a, in its first iteration, we want to, check, we want to uh, look at those journals that, are, that uh, do allow the author to retain copyright and that do allow for CC BY. So that's the first iteration. And much more information will be added afterwards. But we can't do everything at the same time, also in this journal checker tool. We have to get a rough version ready that will work. And that's, that's what we're doing now. And then we will refine the properties in the, in the sense uh, uh, asked by, by Thomas, I, I think. But this is, this is, of course, something that we need to work out to see where the priorities lie for, uh, for, the, uh, for the, all the bells and whistles uh, attached to this journal checker too. And a second one from Ryan. Uh, is there a discussion about effect on early career researchers and sanctions for non-compliance? No, there is no there is no news yet on uh, on uh, uh, sanctions for non-compliance. We this is something that we have no uh, fixed policy on within planners. This is something that we will leave to each funder to decide individually what the sanctions should be. But sanctions there will be, of course. But this is something that, of course, really depends a lot on local law, for instance, as well. And and uh, this so this is not something that you can put without one international policy form. Does that answer the question? We'll see. And then a question from, from Garrett, uh, how will cost effectiveness, uh, not price effectiveness of the transformative uh, arrangements be measured? Second one in the list. Cost effectiveness of the transformative agreement. How will you measure that? Um, I don't think we will. I, I had to think a little bit because, first of all, I mean, our, uh, we very specifically say that we we want price transparency, not cost transparency, because costs is something that you cannot ask a, a, a publisher to share. Um, I mean, this is all this is all tied up with legal issues. So you cannot ask them for costs. We can also only ask them to give us their, uh, their prices. Uh, like I said before, I mean, what we hope that will happen is that by uh, making these prices available on a central website where you can compare across publishers what they ask for the, for different operations, is that, that this will will drive prices down eventually. Um, Cost effectiveness is, is, is something that is very hard to measure for us, I, I believe. We, we, we can't really do that. Uh, uh, but of course, we will be able to compare. A lot of interesting information is going to come out of this. We don't have this information. Now, one of the things, for instance, you have to, you have to put this in the context of, of, of the, the way Planners was devised. I mean, in the beginning, people, uh, some of the people in Planners said that we had to have a price cap. I have always thought that the price cap on APCs was a very bad idea, simply because we don't know what goes into the costs and what goes into the prices. Let me give you one example. The, there is this difference at PLOS, uh, between PLOS 1 and PLOS Biology. Now, the PLOS, at PLOS 1, you pay 1700 for an APC, and at PLOS Biology, you pay 3000 something like that. Now, what is the difference? The difference is simply this. At PLOS Biology, PLOS hires pays researchers in-house as editors, right? At plus one, they don't. You know, this has to be, this has to be, these salaries have to be paid. So that's why the APC is higher there. And this is the case at many publishers. They have in-house editors. Uh, of course, this is not the case, for instance, in my field, in the humanities. This, I mean, I, I am the editor and I do all the work out of my university salary. Um, but apparently many publishers have in-house editors and this, this is a cost that has to be paid. That's, but that's something that we want to know and to be able to compare across publishers, right? Um. 
And then number one now from Czech, uh, I think you said Sage and Emerald now allow a version of record to be added to institutional repositories. Is this correct? Uh, yes, I believe that is correct. Um, I should back, go back to my slides, but I think it's correct, yes. And then a second one from, second question from Miho Funamori. It was not mentioned in the pre presentation, but why is the price transparent transparency rule applied also to non-APC journals. I fear this will be difficult for society journals, especially those journals which are published outside Western countries. Well, um, look, we, we would love this for this to be applied to non-APC uh, uh, non journals. I think actually also diamond, diamond journals should, should, should apply this price transparency rule if, if, if it's possible. Um, it may be difficult for society journals, so that's also why we don't we don't absolutely re re require it. But of course, it, uh, there, there's also various other reasons. I mean, society journals are very small operations. Usually, they're also uh, they are already open. They they are they are they often not um, they are not companies, so they have op they, they, their books are more open and more accessible. But in any case, I mean, we don't object to these uh, society journals uh, presenting their, their, their price breakdown. But, we, but indeed, we also don't require it. Uh, but for instance, the society, the Microbiology Society has been very open about this. They have opened their books. They said, look, this is the price that we require per article. This is, um, you can see that in their presentation. This is what we need to, um, to have our six journals running. And of course, there is nothing, I mean, since we are in, out in the open now and trying to transform this, there's nothing that prevents uh, these, these societies from being more, more open with their, their, their particular costs. And I would certainly welcome such a move. Yeah, a couple more and then we'll, we'll, <laughs> Go, yeah, do, do we'll have me. Neve's presentation. Oh. Sorry, sorry for keeping you waiting, Neve. Um, mirror journals, no, we don't accept mirror journals. That's a very simple one. They are trying to treat it as hybrid, and they can, at most they can be the transformative option, the transformative option of their uh, subscription mayor, but we do not accept mayor journals. Uh, what about research at smaller institutes? Um, yes, that's a, that is a, that is a that is a good one. I would say. Uh, I would say try to form a consortium. Uh, I don't know, of course, my uh, what you are ref uh, who you are referring to, what what institutes you are referring to, but of course, one way of doing this would be simply to join Coalition S as a small institute, and uh, we will help. Um, Will there be a study on such initiatives? No, right now we don't have a study on the on let's say Sage uh, uh, on say Sage and uh, Emerald to see uh, how this um, uh, how this affects their, their their income. That is not something for us to do. I think Sage and Emerald themselves should 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 come out with that information. I believe. Um, but it's, this is something that came out of my, my discussions uh, with, with, with them, that this is actually something that, that, that they are very happy to do. Um, wait, Alice. Yeah, question from Pilar. Uh, are you making contacts uh, contact with uh, research and development evaluation agencies, plan S include uh, specific obligations right for now, them? Not right now, but if you think that we should, then then we can. I mean, we are explicitly not not um, we are explicitly not engaging fully in DORA in the sense that we are not fully developing our own DORA policy. I mean, we follow DORA DORA uh, guidelines and we follow we implement them at the various funders. So what we what we pledge is that researchers applying for grants will be evaluated with qualitative uh, criteria instead of quantitative criteria. That is what we commit to, right? Um, what research, uh, what R&D agencies do is not something that we can directly influence. Uh, this is probably something that is more, that is more for DORA and maybe for universities to, 
to, to do, but we are not directly doing that work. And from Ryan, first one now, what timeline is in place to ensure all publishers move to Plan S journal level price transparent? Yes, that, that is July 2022. By July 2022, the publishers will have to have provided this information. Yeah, and then again, from Pilar about uh, reasonable, reasonable pricing. Well, reasonable pricing is, is, um, is pricing that, that asks, uh, that, that, that you, you see a leveling out of, of, of prices for certain services at, at some point, you know? I mean, when you see, for instance, that uh, outfits that make very little, uh, I mean, what for me would be a reasonable price is the following. A publisher who makes between, who makes profits of between six and 7%, right? Something like that, who asks a very low, uh, and who asks a relatively low APC for, 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 that, for that purpose. That, that I think would be a reasonable price. What is not a reasonable, what is not a reasonable price is a publisher who asks for three to 4,000 euros per article and makes profits of 35%. That is not reasonable. I hope we can agree on that. <laughs> and then the question whether Coalition S wants to make a statement about uh, Council of Europe uh, directive on open data and reuse of public sector no, information? No, we have no statement on that because we don't have to, because we are not about open data again. We are really about open access of articles. Open data is something that we will leave to EOSC and to those initiatives that uh, will administer open data. And whether you engage with Creative Commons Europe? No, there is no direct link for, link for now. Uh, we are just following their uh, recommendations for, uh, CC by, uh, for CC by license. Yeah, and guards, thanked for your answer. Yes. Are there still plans to an APC cap? Uh, not for now. We are hoping that to we are hoping that the price transparency will give us information about these things. Uh, and of course, if we see that things are mo moving in the same direction, in the, in, the go in the right direction, in the sense that prices uh, stabilize at, 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 a, at, at a reasonable, what we think is a reasonable level for the various services, then a, a price cap can be envisaged, of course. But this is something that has to be uh, looked at in, in the future. We first have to ha get those data. Right now, we don't know what motivates the prices of the publishers. So we first need to get that information and we need to get that information analyzed. Thanks a lot, sir. And thanks, thanks for waiting, Niamh. Uh, so now we're moving to second part of our webinar and it, it's about a national mapping exercise. Uh, how national uh, roadmap uh, could be implemented uh, in compliance with uh, Plan S and um, that's Neve's presentation. Thanks a million, um, Irena and uh, Johan. That was a wonderful presentation. How long have I gone, Serena? I just want to check with you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yep. yes. So how long good. have I gone for this? Can you just tell me? Um, I don't know, as, as, as long as you need, I guess, sir. Really? Okay, great. We'll be here all day. Um, I'm only joking. And thanks so much, Johan. That was really interesting. Um, I'm going to speak to you from the perspective of a national um, open uh, research policy makers who were in the middle of writing their policy when Plan S came riding into town all guns blazing. So what did we do? So that's a story that I think is not unique to Ireland. It's one that we've that we've seen. And I have to say that this is um, we are we have a major funder in Ireland. Our biggest funder is a signatory of um, Plan S and is a member of the group that we are working on. So where this is this is something about how we work with Plan S on the ground. I also want to say I was the um, the chair of the publications task group under the initial phase 
of North National Open Research Forum. And um, that is now moving on. And there's quite a lot of developments taking place. You can see from what Johan has told us that Plan S is a moving target. It keeps changing all the time. That's a really good thing. And what we're doing as well, every country, their national consortium um, people, etc., are all working in this area. But I'm just, I've been asked to talk about this experience that we had with mapping our policy as it was developing with Plan S. So I'll just go through here. So for those of you who are, don't know where Ireland is, um, I'm sorry, I'll just go into my, my um, presentation mode. There it is. It's very small. That's one of the um, most important things to say about it. And we have a very tiny population. And there's some other things about it as well. We had a major crash, and um, so we were in serious trouble um, for some time. You might have heard about this. And in libraries, the reality was that we were lucky to hold on to our subscriptions to a lot of journals. We had to cancel a lot of journals at that particular time. So we really know about, you know, the pressures on trying to to um, to keep access. Um, Ireland, at the same time, more than doubled its Horizon 2020 funding. It's considered by some people by the EU to be the EU leader in innovation from um, SMEs. Um, quantitative uh, rankings tell us that it's 11th in the world, if you believe that kind of thing. So um, let's take a look. In Ireland, open access has always been linked in really strongly with innovation, with jobs, and with the wealth and the, um, the prosperity of our society. Uh, from the very beginning, way back, we did that. And they had this idea that we were going to, this is Innovation 2020. It's Ireland's national policy for development of our uh, science and strategy and research and innovation strategy as well. And right in the middle of that Innovation 2020 policy is open access, saying that we will facilitate access access to scientific publications, science meaning, of course, all disciplines, and also that we're going to join up, integrate, and support open access repositories, a national research classification system, the university's research information systems, the grant management system, and all kinds of things like that. So that's the context. We're not seeing it as something that is purely about, it's not, not about libraries particularly, it's not about, you know, um, about costs uh, of society. This is what it's about. It's about impact and it's about making the world a better place. The kind of scholarly publishing landscape we're talking about here then is there's no native large commercial academic journal publishers in Ireland. I would suggest that's quite significant in terms of the fact that um, we, we, have, we do have some small academic book publishers, especially in arts and humanities and social sciences, and they're very much valued. But um, And there's a handful of of learned societies um, that are excuse me, um, that have learned societies. There's tiny independent emerging open access publishers, 16 or thereabouts listed in the DOAJ. We have no national policies or funds for the payments of APCs as yet. Now I've been careful, I'm watching over my shoulder because that could change very quickly. But in, in our 15 year tradition of open access, we don't have, we've never paid, or we've never had a national policy around um, APCs and payment. We've had a massive growth in scholarly publishing, especially in journal articles um, in the first 10 years of funding in Ireland and thereafter. Um, all of our funders and most of our institutions mandated open access green from 2008 onwards, and that's not all that unusual. We have a national infrastructure of repositories and a national open access portal that was developed from around 2002 onwards. Um, we have um, in most institutions, universities, we have the research information system, the CRIS systems, with some level of um, integration with the repositories. Now that might sound a bit geeky, but really what it means at the institutional level is that repositories and research information systems feed information into the universities, telling, giving the universities business intelligence and information about how they're doing. And that's really important from the point of view of the institutions who have to show impact just as surely as, as the funders have to show impact and the individual researchers do, institutions need to do that as well. And I'll come back to that a little bit later because I'm not entirely sure that the institution is doing all that well out of this. They can tend to be the Cinderella's in this situation, doing a lot of work and providing an environment and actually not really getting a huge amount back. So the national open access policies in Ireland were developed, started being developed in 2012 onwards. This is a view of our open access repository network. So to give you an idea, 
it's pretty extensive and there's all kinds of consortia going on with the Institutes of Technology who have their own repositories and we have our national portal Rain, that can give us a view of the numbers of uh, funded by funder of the research outputs and it can also give us a breakdown by institution over time so this is looking kind of okay from the point of view of monitoring it's not all that great though it has to be said because as I mean, you all know that it's not just enough to build an infrastructure you have to build a whole lot of other things around it and you have to maintain that infrastructure so let's see how are we doing. One of the great uh, uh, good news stories that we've had, of course, is HRB Open Research, which is an open research um, publishing platform and that um, does continuous publishing, open peer review, and a whole lot of other really interesting things. So that's been a, a very interesting game changer funded by the Health Research Board, one of our very innovative funders in when it comes to open access. So our Irish open access policy timeline really started back in 2007 when the EURAB recommendations to the European Commission had a chair who happened to be Professor Jane Grimson from Trinity College Dublin, who, um, who had a group of researchers who fed right into the European Commission's very first mandate on open access. And that was the researcher's viewpoint. So that, that's in our roots. I mentioned that to you very much because I hope that we're going to stick to, to those kind of roots as well. That influence and the influence of Professor Grimson, who was also sitting on the chair of, as the chair of the Science Foundation Ireland and of the Irish uh, Research Councils in Science, Engineering and Technology, was her incredibly influen influential. It led to almost immediately to open access, green open access mandates, supportive of our researchers and using the infrastructure that we built um, in 2008. By 2010, all of our funders had open access green mandates. Um, and while it was clear that there were some charges in the minority of journals going on, it never entered our um, mandates at any point. In 2012, we built our national principles on open access publications policy. So there was a statement on that that you can check. And that was aligned with European policy at the time. But we had a problem there because we had this wonderful policy, but there was no mechanism for implementing it. And this is a really key thing. You can have all the wonderful policies that you like, but if you don't have a mechanism for implementing them, then you can, it's, they're not worth the paper that they're written on. So, um, and this slide is from Dr. Patricia Clark from the HRB. I've just adapted it slightly. The National Open Research Forum was established in 2017, and that brought together a whole lot of different groups um, of people to try and work on a, a more comprehensive policy that's going to take in research data as well as publications, rewards and incentives, skills and training, and uh, all of the other areas that were required. That group was just about to launch its national framework on the transition to an open research environment when, as I say, in September or the summer of 2018, when boom, in comes Plan S to everybody's surprise. So, and that didn't look at all like what we had been working on before in its first iteration. Now, I have to say, again, Plan S has moved on a huge amount. It looks quite different to the way it did at this particular time, but we still had to deal with it and to try and figure, juggle this compliance with what we wanted to do on the ground. So there's some information on the National Open Research Forum um, and uh, its time period. Uh, it's now going into its second iteration. So that's, that's about to kick off. The chairs are the Higher Education Authority, the Health Research Board, a funder and the authoritative body over all of the higher education institutions in Ireland. And the Secretariat came from our Government Ministry of Business, Enterprise and Innovation. So you see that connection again is coming all the time with this kind of idea of impact. Reporting to the Innovation 2020 Committee, ideally and hopefully with funding, we're, we're hoping, from the National Development Plan. And that's where it's, where it's, 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 it's um, with us. The working groups were on publications. That's my group, which I see Maura Caffrey is, uh, is here. I hope Yvonne Desmond and a few of the others uh, who I and acknowledge at the end of this presentation. There was a group on fair data and infrastructure, and uh, the membership is there. So the whole idea was to work in synergy with other relevant EU international discussions and develop this common understanding and awareness of national requirements, make the best use of existing capacity, very importantly, avoid duplication of efforts and inconsistencies, and advise on timely and impl efficient implementation in Ireland, 
of EU policy developers. So, you know, quite an easy thing. And I should say, obviously, that this is all, you know, voluntary work that, that people had, were given to this um, area. Nobody's, we've got no ministry department who's responsible for this type of activity in Ireland as yet. A key document was the European Commission's recommendations of the 25th of April 2018. So just keep an eye on these dates. So that was you know, mid-2018. Uh, we were ready to, and that was very important, it set out a clear um, roadmap for member states. And that's still in place, that member states should set and implement clear policies, um, and that they have to be um, accompanied by clear objectives and indicators to measure progress, implementation plans, including the allocation of responsibilities and appropriate licensing, and critically for us, associated financial planning, something that we've never really had before. So this is a document we centered everything, we've mapped everything to this, and I said, and then in comes Plan S, out of the blue, you know, so that, or at least it seemed from the point of view that uh, that, that that was the situation. We had a major funder who had signed it, and we immediately had to sit down and make some decisions very quickly. One was, do we throw out our national plan, which we would be working on for two years, to try and see if we could and just go with, with Plan S, with Coalition S? Um, do we um, just ignore Plan S and go ahead with what we were doing? That wasn't really an option. In the national plan, we need to have all of our funders on board, right? So it's different to, you know, funders' um, policies or to individual institutions' policies. With a national one, you need to have all the funders there. And obviously, we had a Plan S signatory um, who was in the middle of, of this and a very important one too. Um, so we had to do our third route, which was we were going to have to find a common ground between Plan S and our national policy. So here's what we had to sit down and our publication working group will remember this mapping that we did very quickly and we had to do it in about 24 hours. So the kind of issues that came up, that came out of this, the differences between the European Commission's policy, and this of course is moving on as well, at that time, April 20, 25th, 2018, and Plan S, um, which came in in the summer, was the restricted choice of, um, so just only compliant publishers, as it appeared, and I'm stressing this is the first iteration of Plan S. Plan S has moved on. The elimination of embargoes. Remember, the um, H2020 target uh, mandate allowed for embargoes. We always allowed for embargoes, right? So this elimination of embargoes thing was quite a challenge. Um, so that impacts in its own right on the choice of publisher and the choice of the open access route. So the restricted choice of licenses, again, new. We never heard of such a thing. Our licenses are all CC by SA and C. Not because we don't like industry, you see, we're all about industry and, and SMEs and innovation. But what we're also about is impact for the institutions and the researchers. We want the commercial entities to contact us and not just acknowledge out in the blue, in the wild, but to come and work with us if they're uh, engaged in work that we have done. And we would still say, and many of our researchers would say, that is not unreasonable to ask for CC by SANC in certain circumstances. So restricted choice of license, a challenge, a perceived emphasis, I'm saying perceived emphasis on the first iteration in the first iteration of Plan S on publisher fee based models. And remember this, there was a lot of consternation um, about that this is tipping the balance over in favor of wealthy Northern European countries who have a tradition of paying um, APCs largely based on propping up their extremely profitable uh, publishing industries and it has nothing to do with the rest of us who are have no publishing industry using green etc and don't pay APCs and even I've been noticed the saying is even if we had the money to pay them we wouldn't pay them on principle okay that's the um, that was the view However, in the initial Plan S mapping, in order to gain the unanimous endorsement of the Irish National Funders, the NORF, the National Open Research um, Forum, removed its allowance of embargoes and changed its license requirements. And you might say that we we're awful wimps, but we really had no option in this. It was, we had to do it. We had to become um, at least Plan S friendly and to try and do that. But that's not the end of the story. We didn't stop there. So. 
Plan S was generally welcomed by everybody, by Leru, by my own institution, by the North, because we're all working in this common objective for full open access to publications. And it's not just Robert Jan Smith, it's everybody else are sick to the teeth of having to, to work on this. And those of us who are working at the cold face, I know some of you are out there at the moment, who are actually having to trawl around hassle our researchers, asking them for the correct version of the paper, go and manually upload this information into a repository. Obviously, we're moving on from that an awful lot. I'm really getting a bit tired of it and see this as being really unfair. So the fact that Plan S, we've been asking those of us who are open access advocates, have been asking our funders for many years to get more involved because they have genuine clout. And this is what Plan S did. So this is, it's great. I think it's brilliant um, that we're now getting this clarity on alignment across the national statement and Plan S. We have a much better understanding of these opportunities and concerns. For us, we have a national consistency across our disciplines and funding streams, and we're going to have this practical implementation processes, like monitoring, for example, where we can share that kind of an initiative. Um, but there's still a lot of other areas in the details that we need to work out. It is great to see that Plan S has, Coalition S, has moved to address some of the concerns about diamond open access, addressing the, um, readdressing the balance with the green. Um, I'd suggest that we could go a little bit further with that um, and also looking at the diamond model and the bibliodiversity. Um, I'm hoping that we can come and uh, talk about that in a minute. And also um, to look at the, um, the issues of specific disciplines. So I know that Plan S and Coalition S are looking at this. What we did in Ireland, we did that mapping and we, we got agreement um, from the, all of our funders agreed, we did, did enough to, to make it palatable and it's not easy to do that for a whole group of people. Another in, in, a whole group of different interest groups within a country. I should mention that um, because it came up with a, a, a question when Jan and I were discussing, the, or Johan and I were discussing this uh, pre, before this talk, um, a national policy isn't talking about a specific group of funded researchers. It has to apply to everybody in the country. So we actually have a definition of publicly funded, and that's anybody who's in receipt of a public salary. Now that's a different story. Right, so there's no, there's not necessarily any funders there to pay for the researchers' uh, publication charges or for their infrastructure or anything else. If they're in receipt of a public salary, they have to, we're saying, make their publications open access, and that means there's challenges, specific challenges for us in how we're going to support them on that. There was a national consultation phase, um, phase that went on in November, December 2018. You can see this all moved on really quickly. And um, we've learned since then that that wasn't long enough and that we would really need to do a lot more consultation. And that is something and be much more inclusive in who's spoken to. We did what we thought was, the, was correct at that particular time, but um, we've since heard us say that further consultation was needed. A national seminar on Plan S and national policies was packed to the out the door in the Royal Irish Academy in January 2019. A lot of very career researchers in there and a lot of very worried people, especially from arts and humanities coming in there. Um, and after that, we went through an endorsement process. Um, just as we were about to publish it, there was a robust intervention, and I'm putting this mildly, from some very senior and important arts and humanities researchers who had very definite amendments to make and i'll tell you what those were in a minute because we we listened to them and we put in everything that they asked for in this after which we were able to present to innovation 2020 and have a ministerial launch so the story doesn't end there here's the national framework on the, on the transition to an open research environment you can see it's all about a journey it's all about movement it says that and that's obviously openly available and um, the it says these principles build upon existing national and international open research policies and through a planning process to 2020 will move to alignment with developing european commission policy and the principles of plan s where appropriate, right? So the where appropriate is really important um, in this area. What does it cover? Well, I'll go through this kind of quickly because it's, you're not going to see too many surprises um, in it. Um, so 
the all publicly funded Irish scholarly publications will be openly available by default from 2020 onwards. We're saying that's just the default. There's a focus on journal articles. Um, a recognition of disciplinary differences is recognised. Um, again, the transparency about publisher agreements. We can see a lot of Plan S coming in here, but that was already in the European Commission policy too. Um, and we have criteria for compliant journals, platforms and repositories. And we've put in this, this part, which is all researchers, regardless of circumstances, will be able to achieve open access. And there's a real hostage to fortune, if ever I saw one. We've also said we had to move. We had a, a piece of text that said that researchers are free to choose their preferred um, um, publication. They're free to publish where they choose. And that was changed um, to so long as it's in, in accordance with the principles. And uh, various routes were acknowledged including the green or gold, we put back in the embargoes. Sorry, Coalition S, but we are going to, we had to do this. You know, there was absolutely no way that we were going to get agreement from our arts and humanities researchers in particular and the funders who were supporting them unless during the transitional period we were going to acknowledge that some of those embargoes were going to have to be kept in place. We're just talking about a transition. And the reason why is because We've stated something that I'll come back to in a minute, which is about authors retaining copyright. Now in Ireland, we don't have a secondary rights legislation. We don't have it yet. And um, so the authors typically hand over their copyright. There's no national policy to allow it to revert. We have nothing in place that's going to support our researchers to um, apply the copyright. And again, I'm going to say this. If we don't find some ways to support our researchers to retain their copyright and do those deals with the publishers um, for them, then um, it's not worth the paper it's written on. It's purely aspirational, right? It's an empty thing. Um, so uh, copyright is absolutely critical in this area. So there's an emphasis in it on supporting publishers who don't charge fees um, and most open access publishers don't charge fees. So, um, and of course, at that time, there was capping of the fees and that's not there anymore. And of course, no support for open access fees for hybrid, which we never paid anyway, right? We'd no a tradition of that. What our arts and humanities, in particular researchers came in, they, they insisted on an underlying principles that all researchers in Ireland will have access to the resources necessary to enable them to publish through open access without prejudice. This underlying principle was inserted um, and um, we wrote a preamble to which you can have a look at online that sees that there's a commitment to a consultative planning process in Ireland that's going to take place over the next um, period of time that has committed to the engagement of all of the stakeholders, particularly researchers at every career stage representing all disciplines. And there's this commitment to respect, engage with and support the research community, address disciplinary, professional, national and global concerns to benefit researchers equally, and this is really important, avoid unintended consequences, the butterfly effect. That thing where you have that little butterfly flapping its wings and something terrible happens somewhere else. Special consideration to less well understood areas, especially arts and humanities, early career researchers, researchers who don't have grants, publicly funded researchers with no formal institutional affiliation. We're talking about casualization in higher education and let us acknowledge the reality here. Small independent nonprofit publishers and journals, especially Irish journals, learned societies and researchers and citizens in the global south and citizen scientists. So that's just all we have to do over the next um, year or so. The next steps, a national coordinator has been is, is going to be appointed um, for the for to oversee this. The North two committees are already being established. The national consultation will take place um, within an 18 month period, and then we have a new national action plan. So all the time we'll be watching and working with Coalition S, but also with the other agencies to and and what they're discovering, what they're finding to try and make this work for those for um, uh, making sure that we have a uh, coherent policies, but also making sure that this is going to work for our researchers on the ground. So we can say plan S, Ireland's national framework is plan S friendly, but its primary concern is to be Irish research friendly. We have to say that. We're also hoping that our framework is going to be America friendly in terms of its emphasis on academy based infrastructures and alternatives to fee based publishing. And that is not, I have to say, saying anything about Coalition S and America, it's just that's what we want to be able to do. 
And in addition, we're saying that we want to, we committed our actual plan to being cognizant of the issues and supportive of scholarly communication initiatives in the global south. And that's very important to us and to our researchers. This idea of equity and open knowledge, open for whom, is really important to us. We're not, although we might be in Northern Europe, um, we're not one of those wealthy countries with big publishing industries, as I say. Um, and we're very committed to the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the student survey that we had in Trinity last year for Soapbox, 23 student journals are moving over to open access, which is wonderful. But some of the primary things, and thanks Shane and Collins for this information, when they were asked, when they said about the importance of their publications making societal and cultural impact, the majority of the students said it was absolutely essential. And when they were asked about the importance of publications being read and engaged with by people from diverse backgrounds and physical abilities, it, the vast majority of them said it was absolutely essential. So our younger researchers are telling us that this is going to happen. So the change will happen. Very quickly, I wanted to mention something about bibliodiversity. A case study that I looked at in Arts and Humanities recently showed some information that actually surprised the people themselves who were working in this area. We discovered in a study of history and of English language and literature by using the Chris system, which is the only way that we're going to find this information on the landscape, right? You're not going to find it in Scopus or in Web of Science because they don't cover the journals, right? So we discovered that a very small number of articles are published in the major commercially published academic journals like Oxford University Press. Right? So our, this is specific to our area. I'd love to see other people doing this, right? And, com and comparing their findings in these areas um, on the ground. Um, so many of our arts and humanities, our humanities researchers said, oh my God, what are we going to do? We can't afford to pay the uh, open access charges for Oxford University Press. And they have massive embargoes of, you know, 24 you know, months or something like that. I said, you know what, that's not as big a problem as you might think it is, you know. Green open access with zero or minimal embargoes were possible for the vast majority of the commercially published articles with no need for APCs, or they could get away with their, their very short um, um, embargoes as well. However, some of the commercial publishers, especially in arts and humanities, require embargoes of 24 to 36 months, for God's sakes, excuse me. Um, a relatively small number of papers are in the DOHA of the publishers. Journals are in DOHA registered open access journals. The vast majority of the papers published were via an extremely diverse range of small, independent, non-commercial journals, many of whom are difficult to locate or contact. The University of Iowa, somebody working in an office there, probably in the middle of the night. And um, that's where our, our, well, a lot of our people are publishing a single paper in a multitude of journals. Many of these publishers are what I would consider to be at risk. They're minuscule operations. They have no technical support or standards. They don't know what they need to do. They've probably never heard of Planus, and they urgently need support to survive and to transition themselves to diamond open access. We're not necessarily talking about paying them. We're talking about support, and um, but it's in, into a very diverse, and very fragile ecosystem. So I wanted to mention that. I'm going to run out of time, Irina, so I'm worried about this, so I'm going to go quite quickly and through this. So the issues about copyright, and we're in agreement on this, jo Johan and myself are, but in order to be more research and institution supportive, I would like to see all of our policies move to support researchers to retain their copyright, and it's not easy in reality. I have already made the case for a greater choice of licenses without adding in another be process for researchers to go through, give them the information, trust them to make the right choice and offer them that choice and allow them to do it is what I would say because it is causing us a problem on the ground in relation to this. And I mentioned already that non-commercial is not anti-enterprise, it's pro-researcher and it's pro-institutional impact. Immediate open access and choice of open access routes in order to be more re a researcher and institution support requires the elimination of embargoes on, the, a, um, on all hybrid journals under transformative agreements before there's any discussion on subscriptions or APCs. That's the first thing. Before we sit down and talk to them, get rid of those embargoes on the AAM. Um, and require the publishers in receipt of funding of any kind to facilitate the deposit of metadata and the content into the, back to the parent inst institution. For those publishers who are not engaged in transformative agreements and um, to apply copyright retention and require the deposit of the AAM. And if we can't do that, then we have to allow limited embargoes for some disciplines during a transitional phase, as we've done.
that's that's the reality okay um so We've, the peer project showed that publisher embargoes had absolutely no effect. In fact, um, the, the repositories were driving traffic towards the, um, towards the publisher's website. We were actually working as marketers for them. And we can see as well, evidence fails to justify publisher's demand for longer embargo peer, um, um, periods in the London School of Economics Impact blog and the Times Higher says open access, no evidence that zero embargo periods harm publishers, just as Johan said, and just as we've seen. So we, this needs to be finished over, over and done with right now. And I'd love if, if Coalition S could help us together to just work with publishers to do this. So unfortunately, the recent focus on APCs and the pay to reader pay, uh, uh, in hybrid journals has led, and the evidence is there, to publishers introducing or extending embargoes where they never existed before and obstructing green OA. That is the problem with uh, focusing on one side of open access, it can hurt another side of it. And that is why the embargoes need to be challenged. The second thing is on diamond publishing and bibliodiversity. I've mentioned this already. We're all in agreement on this, that we want to support academy-led or um, um, diamond publishing, um, but in order to support that, we do need to provide attention to this area. And it's, I know that the per unit payment is the easy way to do it, but nobody ever said this was going to be easy. There's a there's an infrastructural requirement here that would help those University of Iowa or whoever it is down in County Limerick to run their journals, which are obviously important to our researchers because they're publishing there, right? So they need support in order to keep going and they need support in order to become DOAJ compliant. So we have to help them further down the, the stream before they actually get to this, this thing. And we need to find ways to support at-risk journals that meet the criteria if you can find them. So before it's too late. This will result in, in leveling the playing field. The copyright is free. Oh, sorry, the copyright is key. So a lot of countries have enacted rights and we need concrete support for copyright for, um, retention to be available to all researchers in all countries. We need to restore the freedom of uh, authors to publish where they choose because authors are starting to look at open access as being a problem. And we don't want it, to, we've never presented it as a problem before. It's always been an advantage. We want to show that it's achievable by all authors in all disciplines, not just funded authors and not just institutionally affiliated authors in some disciplines. We want to support the parent institution by facilitating its management of its own research outputs. Now, it's not good enough to have all this stuff out in the wild somewhere. So I'm asking for the attention of publishers and funders to this. Give the parent institutions some kind of help with this and give them back their content, their metadata and their information on impact. And we need much greater emphasis and support for repositories and non-commercial journals. So in that way, we can show that open access is not an external imposition, that researchers are supported to achieve something that they want to do anyway, and that open access will benefit them in terms of impact, recognition, skills, control of their work and their rights, and improved research infrastructure. That open access is easy to achieve, and that local infrastructures and supports are there to help them. That researchers can publish where they wish and achieve open access. That open access will be automated as much as possible, deposit, metadata creation and sharing, saving us all masses of time and money. That minority languages, marginalized groups and disciplines, independent academy-based publishing are supportive and that scholarly communication finally becomes ethical and equitable from a global perspective. I'm going to leave you with just a final thought. This journal is the Journal of the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. It was published for the first time in 1847 a time of, of plague and of, um, I think, pandemic and, and starvation, where the population of, of, of our country was cut in half, at least. Um, and, and that journal started off at the particular time in order to address the great challenges of our society at that time. That journal continues to be published. It's published on open access. It's diamond. All the archives, almost 200 years of them, are available on open access. The cost of publishing that journal is equivalent to less than the cost of a typical two APCs per annum, right? And yet, and oh, actually, we have to recognize some names, Oscar Wilde's father, um, Sir Isaac Bott, various other people, movers and shakers in society at the time, policymakers. This journal was at its instigation and continues to be academy-led, mission-driven, supporting evidence-based policymaking, a fully open access 21st journal that started in 1847. It's diamond, no fees or subscription, and doesn't want any. 
I rejected the idea of, of APCs, but that journal needs to be acknowledged and to take its place alongside the ones that are all shouting for money and so on. And I want to leave you with that thought at this time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Niamh, and uh, there are lots of thanks, sir, uh, in, uh, in the chat as well. Uh, so we have five questions, and if you could stay with us for maybe five more minutes to answer them, that would be great. So if, if you go, Niamh, to Q&A, uh, the first one is from uh, Kunle Ola. Thank you, Niamh, for, for the presentation. How does the National Open Access Portal work? Are all universities, libraries in Ireland connected to the National Open Access Portal? This is, a, this is a great question and it's one of the ones that you see a lot of these infrastructures that were built on the open access repositories on the open access initiative protocol for metadata harvesting. So it's all built on open source software. So, and this is something that's, that actually is really important in, in open science. So they, this was funded by the, um, a project, the libraries were involved in it and the funders and it's built on the open access repositories in all of the universities and in a number of other institutions that, um, that have joined it since then. It could still be developed further, but 10 years later, it's still very functional. We'd like to be able to see it do more, um, but again, that will remain to be seen about whether we can do that under the terms of, terms of the National Open Research uh, Framework. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. And there is a question from Raluca. How do you see the relation between open access and responsible research and innovation? Another brilliant question. So RRI is obviously some of this major issue that's coming into um, to, uh, that we have to address. And those of us who are involved in the European University alliances, we know that we have to address it in our, in our um, proposals. Um, so um, open science is a key it's in one of the um, parts of RRI, but it's strongly linked in with um, open access and open science linked in with research integrity also. And indeed, we can even bring in the elements of gender um, equity and open innovation to that too. One of the courses that I run for, um, for all of our um, research um, students, at our PhD students in Trinity is actually called uh, Research Integrity and Impact in an Open Scholarship Era. So all of our students have to do that course and they get the RRI and the research integrity alongside how to manage their data, how to, um, how to be open access, how they're evaluated and what fair evaluation looks like for them. So they're equipped to go anywhere in the world and know not only how, what these things mean, we're hoping they'll be able to take a leadership role in that. So yeah, it's, it's really important. And then um, a question from Alexei Kowalewski. What libraries were in the center of start of open access national movement and helped to create national open access repositories policies or open access policies? Sir? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, it's a, it's a, we've got a, a very small country. So even when one small institution moves quickly, then everybody else pays attention. The first university in Ireland to set up an open access repository was Maynooth University back around 2002, which was the time, you know, DSpace became available, ePrint started becoming involved. And it was actually down, I'm going to mention uh, Suzanne Redmond Maloko. Um, sometimes we have individual pioneers and leaders who, who just go ahead and they do something and they lead their institutions in this way and that's what we've saw, seen dcu dublin city university was the next one trinity was the next and bit by, then we got a um uh, a group a mass a critical mass around it the um the government saw that there was a uh, requirement for this and a project became a project funded became available so we built together brought in the all of the universities and some of the other institutions came in there at that time so that's who that's how it started um okay this one here which is um, do irish universities have and if they have maintain their own OAOS policies or do you have a national policy only? Again, that's, that's a really good one. There's a real mixture. So that what we've got um, here is that most Irish, um, Irish universities have similar policies on, as regards open access to the funders and those were green open access. So in my institution in Trinity, we have a green open access policy from 2010 on, onwards. So we're seeing that, um, that our institutions often follow the funders and they, they localize the, the requirements. 
our funders and our institutions together, because we're so small, are always looking at the European Commission and always looking at what's happening. Welcome Trust obviously was incredibly influential, and we're always looking at, um, we're, we, we're also looking at Amelica and, and other um, uh, agencies out there to see what they're doing in order to get the best version. We share information a lot across, like any family, of course, there's fierce competition that goes on at some levels, but at the infrastructure level and at the this area of policies, the Irish universities and higher education institutions work really well together. And so they share their policies there. So they maintain their own, but the national policy is supposed to, they're supposed to, the institutions are supposed to hopefully endorse that down the line and we'll all have the same policies, which will make life easier for our researchers, of course. Um, and that's important with, with Plan S as well, I think, is when we think about our researchers, we really don't want to have a whole bunch of different messages coming to them at the same time. We want to try and help them deposit once or do something once and, and it will, everything that they need to do will happen out of that. So um, what challenges did you encounter when you initiated and developed the National Open Access Infrastructure? Do you know, I mean, the, the or if you're talking about the repositories and the, um, the uh, harvesting and so on, that is such a tried and true, true model. The Dutch started it in, I think, um, 2005 or thereabouts. Um, open air is built on the this whole idea of distributed uh, repositories it's kind of like basing acting local and thinking global and so um it works really well in this environment so because it's so well tried and trusted and well proven at this stage there's actually not that difficult to run a national open access infrastructure in this regard the difficulty is trying to mainstream it the infrastructural side of it we need more we need a national digital preservation layer for example our national chris system fell down because and um, we really need that to be linked in so um so there's a lot more that we need to do in that so it's keeping things going and mainstreaming projects that are the biggest challenges um how do funders plan to work directly with publishers to uh, fund diamond journals? Oh, that's an interesting one. I think that's one for Johan um, to see. I know you're doing a study on it now, um, Johan. So but I don't know if you have any ideas on this about what will specific subjects be identified? Will there be an application process set up? Or is it too early to tell, Johan? I think you're still mute muted, Johan. Uh, you mean in which application process for? So the question is from Ryan and he's asking, how do funders plan to work directly with publishers to fund Diamond's journals new or existing? Would specific subjects be identified and would there um, be an application process set up? I'm suggesting it might be a bit too early for you for Coalition S since you have this study going on, but perhaps you have some ideas on well, this. I don't think, I don't, I, I don't think we would work with them. Um, with publishers to, 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 well, it depends what you mean by publishers, right? I mean, if you see the Open Library of Humanities as a publisher, I mean, I would love to work with the Open Library of Humanities. I already work with them because, I mean, my journal is being published there, Glossize, uh, and we are supported by them. Um, would there be an application process set up? I mean, I, I don't know. This is, this is really all too, too early to tell. Uh, uh, my own feeling is, we don't need additional journals. I mean, there are already enough journals out there. Um, we may need some new diamond journals in specific topic uh, subjects. That that is true. But again, we won't know uh, unless we have the overview uh, of of the field, the, the overview that we need. I mean, diamond is is is, is a very diverse landscape. Um, I mean, it's very different in South America from from Northern Europe. Uh, it's still different in the US or in uh, South Africa. I mean, we really need a much more complete overview of what is out there. I mean, because we, under, we, we totally underestimate uh, its impact. So before we can say, look, we need uh, journals here and there, maybe we should first see what there is and what needs to be uh, consolidated and, and helped uh, forward. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be really interested, Johan, to see how your study, the um, agency that you've contracted to, to undertake this. I'm very intrigued with all of your secret information. I'm dying to find out who's going to Well, that was my purpose, right? I mean, make everybody very curious uh, and no. watch, uh, watch um, for what we are doing. 
So um, that's, and it's great that you're doing it. And um, what I'm hoping is that we'll be able to work uh, locally to try and identify some of these journals. I have to say, I was really surprised when I looked at the, what was going on in some of our areas. And, and I mentioned again, the only way of knowing what's happening in these, how, where the publishing behavior is going on, is through Chris systems, if you have them or the registry of the, um, so the Chris systems are absolutely vital in this. There's no other way of finding out where these things are. I was able to look at my Chris over the past five years and find out exactly where people in history and humanities are publishing. And that's where those single um, individual little journals came in. I wrote to the journals and asked them and their editors who were very kind, mostly usually professors in other institutions. And they got back to me straight away and they said but of course you can deposit the and uh, the um the paper in the repository we have no problem with that at all so they're already open they just don't even they're not living in this world i really think they need some help and support to do this Absolutely. i would be very concerned that um i i think as i said to costas linus at one point that i said if europe is about anything it's about diversity and we're going to find that this is going to be even more important in our new abnormal situation post COVID that we're going to. Uh, I totally agree, actually. That, uh, that, I mean, that I, I personally think that that will accelerate uh, uh, open access. Uh, I, I really hope that it will. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we will have to see. Okay, so I'm hoping that, that some solutions will be found and maybe people who are interested in this area who are on this call will watch out for this announcement. I'm assuming that there will be a contact, you know, sort of there and maybe it's something that our friends in Open Air and Eiffel could, could help and run another webinar like this because there seems to be lots of interest in it. Thanks a lot, sir. So I think we answered all the questions, sir. And thanks a lot for staying with us for two hours, sir. And uh, as well, a lot of oh, thank you notices, sir, in the chat, sir. Thank you for organizing this, Irina and Marina. Can I answer Richard Bruce um, there, Richard Bruce Lanfrey there, please. And did you say you have national open access thesis platform and open access journal platforms? We have an open access portal, so it'll identify the open access theses. But actually, Dart Europe is really effective. It also harvests the out of the repositories and shows that it's, it's a digital access to research thesis Europe based in UCL. Um, so that's what we use for the, the thesis portal. Um, but it all appears in our national portal as well, of course. So I hope that that helps. But contact me, my details are there. If anybody has any interest in, in following up on any of these ideas or issues or wants to work together on any areas. Thank you very much. So we'll upload slides uh, and record into the webinar page and we'll also email everyone um, with this information when uh, recording and slides are available. Thanks a lot. Uh, have a good rest of the day. And thanks again, Johan and Niamh and Marina for being here. Thanks, Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you all for attending. Bye. 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 Bye.